Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Eileen O'Connell and I have the privilege of managing Special Collections Library for the city of Albuquerque. And when I was approached about whether we could be a venue for this program, I was honored and excited. I think it is a story that needs telling and we are very deeply grateful to the New Mexico Japanese American Citizens League and the New Mexico Humanities Council for making it possible for us to, to bring this to you. Hello, thank you for coming, and I'm excited and honored to be here. I'm Nikki Nojima Lewis, and I'm the Humanities Scholar and Program Designer for these series of presentations on the Japanese uh, prison camps of New Mexico. This project is, as I said, a part of a continuing series sponsored by Japanese American Citizens League of New Mexico, or JSCL. Uh, and we are very grateful for funding from the New Mexico Humanities Council that enables enables us to go to seven different venues in a week. So, um, I'm particularly grateful to Eileen O'Connell, who squeezed us into her very uh, busy program series, People Create Cities. Because as soon as I heard that title, I knew what people and what cities I wanted to tell you about. And these are the people who lived in towns behind barbed wire and under gun towers and made lives for themselves from 1942 to 1945 and some 1946 during World War II. But first I'd like to acknowledge our sponsoring organization, JSCL, which is a civil rights organization and after you see our historical presentation, you'll see why it's a civil rights organization. Yuki Nakayachi is co-president of New Mexico JCL, newly initiated, because we need, you know, fresh blood. <laughs> and Calvin Kobayashi has had uh, every, uh, served as every official uh, you know, uh, role on the board, and he is now treasurer, so he's a very important person <laughs> to our grant. He is also the godfather of Akimatsuri, if you're familiar with the fabulous festival that goes on every uh, September and wears us all out. So I'm here to wear us out, you know, further. So, would uh, give us a few words about New Mexico JCL, how it might differ from the national JCL and other branches, and what your goals for us are. And you know, there's a mic over there if you'd like to use that. So, um like Nikki said, my name is Yuki. Um, I'm one of the co-presidents for New Mexico JACL. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, as some of you may know our organization from Akimatsuri, which is the uh, fall festival we just had in September uh, at NHCC right down the street here. Um, what you may not know is that we are the state affiliate for uh, the larger organization, um, Japanese American Citizens League, which is the country's oldest Asian American civil rights organization. It's founded in 1929. Um, so while Akimatsuri is, is not particularly focused on civil rights and is more cultural, um, I guess you could, you could say that this uh, is one of the components of our chapter's civil rights work, which is, you'll see the sign over there, confinement in the land of enchantment. Um, I can't say that I have a very strong connection to the camps beyond what I learned in American history um, because my mother emigrated here in 1975. Um, but I have met many people that were in camp or had family members in camp, so I know this is kind of near and dear to their hearts and I, and I do recognize that's a very important um, thing to sort of 
remember, especially in this day and age. Um, maybe Calvin can fill us in on the uh, sort of the earlier history of New Mexico JACL. Yeah, New Mexico JACL, the early days. <laughs> uh, yeah, I actually was involved with uh, the uh, reformation of uh, JACL, although it was more like a Japanese club way back when. And uh, we met uh, a couple times in a couple community places and a couple of uh, homes of people that were interested in uh, forming the Japanese organization. And uh, a gentleman that's no longer here was actually the uh, key person that uh, brought us together and, and said, hey, we, we need to do this. This is an important organization. Uh, we need to tell the story. We need to bring the Japanese community together. And so that's pretty much what we, we've done over the years over there. Um, it was very much um, based on, you know, share the Japanese experience and let's, let's try to do something uh, in, in terms of uh, making sure that uh, the Japanese American experience is not forgotten. And um, by doing so, uh, somehow trying to uh, make sure that the remembrances are there and to uh, build community. And that's mainly what uh, New Mexico JACL has done is to, to build community. And, uh, and by having the community, then you share your experiences. And uh, this is certainly uh, you know, a culmination of some of that uh, hard work that uh, JACL has done and some individuals here. Thank you, thanks. And before I forget, um, if there's any aspect of this afternoon's program that interests you or you have questions about it, we will have a discussion panel and a Q&A, you know, at the end of the afternoon. But of course, our, you know, time is always limited. But there's a contact sheet there and I would love to have your name and uh, your, your contact information, your email or your phone number and I will get back, I will respond to every one of those and a pass on you know, whatever your concerns are. So this is all about community dialogue. We all live in a community, we're all, I was taught we were all brothers and sisters in the civil rights movement. You know, I'm that old and, and I somehow had the feeling that we would go marching into the future holding hands and singing, we shall overcome. So, um, but I'm still alive and I still have that hope. One member of our project team is Sam Mihara, who lives in California, and he will join us tomorrow. So I said that we have seven venues in a week. On Monday, we'll be in Lordsburg and Silver City. On Tuesday, Las Cruces, where the mayor of Las Cruces, uh, newly reelected by a 51% uh, vote, will join our panel then back to Albuquerque at the Maxwell Museum on November 18th at 7.30. Thursday, we're off to Gallup, where Medal of Honor winner Hershey Miyamura will join us, and we'll end up back home in Albuquerque on November 20th, uh, 20th at 11.30 at the Downtown Library. So if you attend any of these other events at the Maxwell on November 16th, 18th, or the main library on the 20th, you will not be seeing, seeing the same program as today. Because Sammy O'Hara will be taking over as principal presenter. And so you will hear from him, his childhood experience at Heart Mountain, Wyoming, where he was in, incarcerated. And, but today, I and Herbert Tsuchia will talk to you about Minadoka, the camp in Idaho where we spent some of our childhood years. So Herb, how old were you when you were in Minidoka? Uh, I was uh, 10 years old. I was born October 7th, 1932, during the first Great Depression. And do you remember what block you were on? Uh, I was in block 13, barrack six, apartment C. Okay, thank you. And so will you help me with this presentation? Gladly. So Herb and I 
are from Seattle, way up there in rain country, and he's flown here specifically to be with us this afternoon and the following week. So I was born in Seattle and spent the first three years of my life there. The beginning of the fourth year, December 7th, 1941, started with an attack on a place called Pearl Harbor, and the next day, World War II. Mr. Vice President, Mr. Speaker, members of the Senate and the House of Representatives, yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. When the news came over the radio, my mother said, what is Parahaba? The day of the attack was Nikki's fourth birthday. On that day, the FBI entered her home in Seattle and removed her father, as well as hundreds of other Issei first-generation Japanese in Hawaii and in the mainland. After interrogation at an army camp, Nikki's father was held first in Lordsburg, then Santa Fe prison camps from 1942 to 1946. But first, let me provide a little historical context. The National JCL's curriculum and resource guide states that the seeds of prejudice were sown nearly a century earlier when the first immigrants from Asia arrived. In the early days of the West, the Chinese had been imported to take over the jobs that white men shunned. The Chinese, who'd done the hardest and dirtiest work of building the West, were driven out as soon as the work was finished. In 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act barred further Chinese from entering the United States. So the ouster of the Chinese in America created a labor shortage, and that encouraged Japanese immigration. Scores of young men boarded ships like the America Maru, headed for adventure and fortune. America, in America, dollars grow on trees. You just reach up and pick them. America, in America, the talk is all of gold. The gold rush and gold mountain and golden fields of grain. Days of spacious dreams. I sailed for America, overblown with hope, overblown with hope. When the Japanese arrived, we became the natural successors to the Chinese. Fishing, farming, mining, cutting lumber, building the railroad. I built the tracks on which America travels. The railroad worker, me. And then I remember my father was one of those uh, railroad workers. Uh, he was hired by the railroad industry after the Russo-Japan War, when Japan was suffering a, a Great Depression. He was educated as a school teacher, but couldn't get a job. So the railroad comp, uh, industry and the, and the mining industry and, and the forestry industry came to places like Japan and uh, the Philippines to recruit low-cost laborers to come to America. In 1908, the presence of Japanese was causing concern in some quarters, so Japan agreed to stop the flow of male laborers coming to America. And in return, it was called the Gentleman's Agreement between the United States and Japan. The men who were already here in America were permitted to marry or to send home for their families. Many men arranged proxy marriages, thus, a young man working in America might now exchange photos with a young woman in Japan. This so-called picture bride would then set sail for America. 
and many weddings ensued. Two years ago, I selected this photos out of hundreds of photos of newlywed Japanese couples for a presentation in Japan. And my daughter said, take this one, mom, they're so cute. Well, last year I learned that these are Victor Yamada's, our JSCL board members' parents. <laughs> <laughs> transformed the largely bachelor workforce into family men. And the birth of offspring to immigrant families marked a new era in the history of Japanese Americans. The second generation of Japanese Americans is called Nisei. Nisei. We grew up integrating both the Japanese ways of our parents and the mainstream customs of our fellow Americans. We worked at our family-run businesses after school, but still played kick the pan, can and baseball. We still listened to Jack Benny on the radio and the Lawn Ranger. Hi-yo, Silver. And we sang along with the top 10 on the hit parade. Many of us believe we had achieved the American dream. But, Pressure groups continue to sow the seeds of discrimination. For a while, encountering a person who is anti-Japanese, I rub against a spirit out of harmony with mine. In my strong belief, I lived as in a tower and weathered abuse. I pledge allegiance to I the I was a creature of two worlds, of the United approaching States. manhood with an American heart and mind and a Japanese face. I was steeped in American culture, but aware of an alien heritage, living in a society not quite ready for me. At times I ask myself, what am I? Where am I going? Where we were going was into World War II. Within hours, the FBI re removed 736 Japanese resident aliens as security risks from Hawaii and the mainland. I had always thought that this occurred on December 8th or the days after, but I learned from reading my father's FBI files at the National Archive that he did, you know, indeed, he was indeed removed from our home on December 7th. So that means the FBI interrupted my birthday? On December 8th, in a radio address to the nation, President Roosevelt offered these in indelible words a day that will live in infamy. War is declared on Japan. Also on December 8th, the financial resources of the Issei community were frozen, and the FBI seized community leaders, Buddhist priests, Christian ministers, Japanese language teachers, owners of commercial fishing boats, all those thought to be security risks. February 19, 1942, Three months after the attack on Pearl Harbor and the declaration of war, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which set into motion the incarceration of 120,000 persons of Japanese ancestry, a majority of them American citizens. Most of the Issei men sent to Santa Fe, Lordsburg, and Fort Stanton in New Mexico were aliens, simply because they had been denied citizenship by Asian exclusion laws. 
And most of these men had lived in the United States for years and had fathered American-born children. Military zones were established on the West Coast. Japanese living in Zone 1, the western halves of California, Washington, and Oregon would soon be removed from their homes. These images speak for themselves on the climate of abuse that Issei and Nisei endured during the war. When the war broke out, I was a 20-year-old trucker working for my father, an Issei potato farmer. I knew I couldn't continue trucking during the war and asked my father what to do. Without batting an eye, he said, Enlist in the army, Ben. America is your country. My brother Fred and I got in the car and drove 150 miles to the nearest recruiting station to volunteer. When we got there, the recruiter said, we don't want Japs. One sign on a drugstore that had to close due to the forced removal of their owners reads, many thanks for your patronage. Hope to serve you in the near future. God be with you till we meet again, Mr. and Mrs. Kisera. Japanese residents of Terminal Island near Los Angeles Harbor are given 48 hours to leave. Evacuees must carry with them bedding and linens, toilet articles, extra clothing, sufficient knives, forks, spoons, plates, bowls, and cups, essential personal effects for each member of the family. Japanese residents of Bainbridge Island, a farming community in Washington State, are given six days to pack, dispose of their farms, properties, and possessions, and sent to Manzanar, a camp in the Sierra Nevadas. Soldiers holding guns with bayonets took us to the station. The shades were pulled down over the windows we didn't know where we were going. By November 1942, the move to 10 permanent camps was complete. Manzanar, California. Granada, Colorado. Poston, Arizona. Gila River, Arizona. Heart Mountain, Wyoming. Topaz, Utah. Rohrer, Arkansas. Jerome, Arkansas. Minidoka, Idaho. Jerome and Rohrer were, the, were in the swampland lowlands of Arkansas. The other camps were in desert or semi-desert areas subject to dust storms and extreme temperature. One woman was told that the gun towers were there to protect them. Then how come the guns are pointed inside toward us? Asked her husband. In 1943, Ralph Merritt director of the Manzanar camp, asked Ansel a Adams to take photographs of the camp and its peoples. Adams' photographs were published in a book to much controversy because of the uh, animosity against Japanese. The title, Born Free and Equal, The Story of Loyal Japanese Americans. Ansel Adams' Manzanar photos are published in this book, Manzanar, which is still in print. The foreword is written by John Hershey, author of the book Hiroshima. In 
110 degrees in the <coughs> summer, 30 degrees below in winter, ankle deep in mud during the rainy season. And this is a generic statement throughout the 10 camps. Standard housing, nothing but a long empty barrack, 20 by 100 feet. One cot, one mattress, and two blankets per person. One light bulb, and one coal burning stove. Partitions don't even reach the ceiling. There's no privacy. I didn't sleep a wink last night. My baby cried all night. We know. No. We are cooped up in this 20 by 20 foot room, sleeping, dressing, ironing, hanging up clothes, all in this tiny room. We're always standing in line. Standing in line to get supplies. Standing in line to take a shower. Standing in line to eat in the mess hall. Standing in line in front of the root latrines. Just one open room with 12 toilet bowls arranged back to back. No partitions, no privacy. My mother was so modest. It was just agony for her sitting down like that in front of other people. But we set about creating a life for ourselves in these dismal conditions. We partitioned the barracks into tiny rooms with blankets. We made benches, tables, and shelves from scrap lumber. We organized baseball teams, swing bands, arts and craft activities, flower arranging clubs, newspapers, church groups. We converted the barracks and mess halls into classrooms. The assignment one Caucasian teacher gave us was Write why you are proud to be an American. Here's Nikki and her mother on block 44, the last block in Camp Minidoka. My block was block 13, and um, there was a man called Mr. Nita who, who created a little zoo in our, our block he captured por porcupines, uh, skunks, crows, uh, rattlesnakes, and other uh, animals around, around the camp area and, and made, made this little, little uh, zoo that uh, us children in, in our block really like to look at once in a while. And uh, I remember uh, playing on the coal pile at, with my other buddies at, as a 10 year old and getting our, all of our clothes real dirty so that our mothers had to wash it on the washboard with Fels and Apple soap by hand. Um, we, we had a lot of fun as little kids. I remember catching a cat by its tail and swinging it in the air and throwing it into the irrigation ditch because I was curious. I wanted to see if it could swim and it dog paddled, but it ran away from me. It didn't like me anymore. The average population of these camps was 10,000 people. So it was indeed a, our, a town, and Minadoka was our town. The honor roll of the young men and women of Camp Minadoka who served in the United States Army, you can see for yourself. And four of my brothers served in the U.S. military while the rest of their family was in prison. You have the, your brother's Purple Hearts to show us while we're on tour, right? Oh, there they are. Here are two of my brother's, oldest brother's Purple Hearts. He, he was wounded twice in it Italy. Something held there. Thank you. So these were, and, and Gail Okawa will, will talk further about this when she talks about Santa Fe. Many of these young people uh, came to uh, Santa Fe camp to visit their fathers or you know, a family member dressed in US military uniform on their way to the front. And many of them did not return. This was a picture taken of one of my brothers when he came to visit our family in camp, while we were in Minidoka camp on, on leave on a furlough. 
The 442nd Regiment Combat Team and the 100th Battalion became the most highly decorated units in the U.S. military history with one of the highest casualty rates of the war. Over 30,000 Nisei boys served in all Japanese units of the military. We felt we had to prove our loyalty, and we did it in blood. This is the officer that comes through the barbed wire gate of uh, an internment camp to hand the folded flag to the grieving mother or father. At Manzanar and Tule Lake, stone monuments are erected in memoriam. February 19th has been named Remembrance Day. Families make pilgrimages to keep the memory of the camp experiences alive for their children, their grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. August 10, 1988, President Ronald Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, requiring payment of $20,000 and an apology to the estimated 60,000 survivors of incarceration, although the total number that were incarcerated were, remember, 120,000, so only half survived and only half received uh, that letter of apology. Here is a copy of the White House letter that I received. And there's at least one person in the audience I know who also received that letter. My parents did not live to see this day, and an apology would have meant a great deal to them. But I took my $20,000, and at the age of 64, I entered graduate school. So I stand before you today, Nikki Nojima Lewis, PhD. And I stand before you today, Herbert Minoru Chichia, uh, as a retired pharmacist, a retired legal drug dealer, <laughs> peace activist, uh, what is that? An actor and, and a legal drug consumer. <laughs> and in Hiroshima, he's known as Jodan Sensei, the professor of jokes. You can see why. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and now I have the pleasure of bringing you Dr. Gail Okawa to help us segue into the New Mexico portion of our program and to the, understand the differences between the war um, relocation authority camps, the so-called family camps that Herb Samihara and I were in, and the DOJ, Department of Justice camps of Lordsburg, Fort Stanton, and um, Santa Fe. And um, because Gail has to be in Santa Fe this afternoon, she will make a graceful getaway uh, as soon as she finishes. But uh, we are so pleased of her generosity that she wants to be here today to speak to us. And if you're in Santa Fe, if you could get to Santa Fe tomorrow, uh, she'll be speaking at the New Mexico History Museum at two o'clock tomorrow. And we'll be on our way to Lordsburg. Gail Okawa. for those of you maybe who uh, don't know too much about the subject. Um, as a sansei, which means a third generation uh, Japanese American, can you all hear me? Yeah. Oh, no, better now, okay. Sorry, I forgot about this. <laughs> um, so as a sansei, uh, which means I'm a third generation um, Japanese American, um, I was actually a grand, I am a grandchild of Japanese immigrants. And um, I learned about my family's connection to the wartime imp uh, imprisonment story very slowly as a person from Hawaii. Um, 
family never talked about it. And um, it really wasn't until I was an adolescent that a neighbor happened to mention it. I'm trying to remember exactly what happened, but I believe we had studied something about it in school. And I must have mentioned it to this, uh, this neighbor. And she said, oh, your grandfather was interned. Well, I had n never heard of that. Um, and the connection between this thing I had studied in a history class and um, my, own my own family was kind of startling. So I ran home and questioned my parents, who only said, yes, they acknowledged that this had happened. And they said he came back a changed man. No explanation beyond that. And as a kid, I didn't think to ask. Um, I didn't really, it wasn't really my place in many ways in those days to ask a lot of questions. So that kind of got buried in my history for a very long time. The New Mexico connection I have um, actually uh, really became evident to me much later as an adult in the 1990s. Um, at that time, my mother happened to bring out letters from her father from Lordsburg and Santa Fe. And I didn't know anything about this, um, but that was the first step. And then there was an NCTE, the National Council of Teachers of English, of, of which I was a member, um, and the Japanese American National Museum uh, held a workshop here in Albuquerque at a, at a spring conference of the NCTE. And I attended it, hoping to find out something um, about the Santa Fe uh, connection. At that time, a woman named Jennifer Yazawa, who is from the JCL, um, now I don't know if she was a member of the JCL at the time, but any, anyway, she uh, did write a note to me, uh, but it was very um, unclear exactly where the Santa Fe camp was. So I made a trip up to Santa Fe, and it, I'm sorry, can you hear me okay back there? Okay. Um, I made a trip up to Santa Fe, asked questions, Nobody could tell me really where it was. Um, it was as though it hadn't even been there. Um, so I, I kept probing, basically. Um, and the path to my learning something more concrete really came in 2001, right around the time of 9-11. I was writing a sabbatical proposal I, as an academic, you know, I had a a chance to, to go on sabbatical and, and do some major project. And um, I was writing a proposal to try to find out more about this, these camps and where, where my grandfather had been, because that was a huge question mark in my mind. So I was writing this proposal, and I believe it was just shortly, days maybe after that, that, uh, that I had to submit it, that 9-11 that happened. I was driving to um, teach my classes, and I heard this thing on NPR that sounded surreal. They were talking about the tr buildings being attacked, and, and it sounded like the War of the Worlds, you know, the Orson Welles War of the Worlds from way back. Um, it just sounded very surreal, but then when I got to, to school, I, uh, to the university, I realized that this was not a joke. This was for real. And so um, we, my students and I uh, tried to talk about these things and, and I tried to get them to think about um, what happened after Pearl Harbor and the uh, internment of the Japanese Americans and what might happen in this case um, to, to people of uh, Middle Eastern descent. It was a very interesting and profound discussion actually. But it was, it was in this period then that I had known about the, the WRA camps, the World War Relocation Authority camps, which <coughs> Nikki showed you photos of. Um, but I started to learn more and more about the Department of Justice camps. <clears throat> and actually I, I learned as I, as I um, did more and more research that if there was a, a cooperation, some would call it collusion, between the, war, the uh, Department of Justice and the Department of War. 
Um, they were preparing for these kinds of, e this possible event uh, way before December 7th, 1941. And um, I thought it was extremely interesting that, the, that they had lists of Issei, as uh, Herb mentioned, uh, the first generation immigrants. They had lists of these people long before December 7th, which shows that there was clearly uh, an anticipation of problems. So Pearl Harbor was not the sneak attack that it has been uh, made out to be. Um, my sabbatical project then led me further and further into this, um, into this study. And when I was at the National Archives, I went through all kinds of these boring gray file boxes full of documents. And um, first, of all, first of all, just looking for documents about my grandfather. I just wanted files on my grandfather and I found, found five of those. Um, from the Department of Justice, the Office of the Military Governor of the Territory of Hawaii, um, Department of Justice file included the FBI um, information, of course, um, and, and the in, uh, Immigration and Naturalization Service. Uh, so there, I found five files on my grandfather. But while I was doing that, digging through these boxes, I started seeing there were hundreds of people from Hawaii who were also incarcerated as my grandfather had been. So um, while I was doing this, while I was doing this, um, I realized that there was a large contingent from Hawaii, that they were actually separated in, you know, in separate files and that they uh, were considered a cohort, a, a specific cohort. Um, so I s started thinking maybe instead of doing this very large group of people who were incarcerated by the Department of Justice, I would focus specifically on those who um, were from Hawaii, who were taken from Hawaii. Um, there are about 700 of those people. And as I said, th there were many files on them. So this ended up being a 13-year research and writing project. Very long time. Uh, life, of course, intervened at different points. Um, but I am trying to culminate it in a book, which I've titled Exile from Paradise. And I hope it will be out in the next 10 years. <laughs> I'm hoping it will be out um, within the next year or two. Um, so this involved the, the archives research. Um, I started doing interviews with families. This, was, this became a really interesting part of the study. Instead of only looking at texts, at documents, I started talking to people, to people whose family, whose fathers had been interned. Intern, I had, there were four internee survivors I was able to talk to. And I've tried to, to gather all of these stories and put them into this book. Um, my talk tomorrow is called uh, Compound, Compounded Ironies in World War II. Japanese internee fathers, American patriot sons. So there's an echo of what Nikki was talking about um, in the slideshow. Um, one of the lists that I found just startled me and angered me all at the same time. But it was an 11-page list of Japanese civilian internees, or uh, these men like my grandfather and Nikki's father, who um, had sons in the military. So an 11-page list with 161 N uh, names of internees with 260 or two, I think it was two, it was over 200 sons, 220 sons or something like that. So clearly there were men who had one son, some who had two, and in not so rare cases, some who had three and four sons in the military at the same time. And then I think Herb, you said you had four, right. So, um, 
I, that, that really struck me, and, but it was a way, it was actually, <coughs> this list was actually a way where I could talk to the sons. I had, now that I had the names of the sons. So I could talk to the sons and find out things about their fathers. And it became a really fascinating part of the study to learn that, um, as Nikki said, some of these men, when they were in their 18, 19s, and 20s, you know, they were very young when they started out, um, went to visit their fathers, and a number of them, of course, were killed in action as well. So my talk tomorrow is going to be focused specifically on uh, the background to the, um, the military sons, and in a, sen in a sense, the background to this, how this list even came about. Uh, because clearly, the army also saw that there was something wrong here. With, with these young men going to war with their fathers locked up. And that started a whole process in, into motion. Um, the the um, talk will be, as I said, it will be at the New Mexico History Museum and it will be at two o'clock and it is free. <laughs> so I hope some of you might be able to join us. It would be very nice to see you there. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Thank you. Yeah. Break a leg. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, when I went to the National Archives in Washington, D.C., um, oh, maybe five or six years ago, I got shivers. Uh, I read what was carved at, at, the, uh, at the entry. What's past is prologue. And so what we have been immersed in this afternoon is the past. But uh, taking Shakespeare at his word, the past informs the present and thus the future. So our next two speakers will talk about the current and the future activities of a project called CLOVE, Confinement in the Land of Enchantment. It's a project of the National Park Services. And um, so I want to introduce Victor Yamada, the son of the married couple in 1929, and uh, uh, Lynn Oshima. Obviously, I'm a few years older. Uh, well, obviously, I wasn't even born in that uh, time period. But uh, um, hopefully, I've aged well for, for my parents. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> now, continuing the discussion as far as the internment experience in New Mexico, uh, as, uh, uh, as Nikki mentioned, uh, the New Mexico JCL currently has a major project that's in partnership with Colorado State University, the uh, Public Lands Legacy Center there, or history, the Public Lands History Center. Um, and again, the project is confinement in land of enchantment, Japanese Americans, in New Mexico during World War II. And uh, we're using the acronym CLO. You see a poster over there with uh, the, uh, uh, the cover page that we used in the work plan. Uh, as uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Akawa mentioned, uh, Japanese Americans were imprisoned in New Mexico during the war. Um, and uh, we're in the midst of the project now to document fully that uh, imprisonment and then to help educate the public uh, on this World War II uh, New Mexico history. The, as, again, as Nikki said, the project is primarily funded by the National Park Service under its program, which is called Japanese American Confinement Sites. Uh, we're addressing uh, four sites. You've already heard about Santa Fe and Lordsburg, and then two smaller sites in Lincoln County uh, Fort Stanton and uh, Old Raton Ranch. Uh, the, the three tasks that we're uh, conducting were installing historic markers at the sites where, where none currently exist. Uh, we will prepare an outreach publication um, for the public and then we'll produce a website so that anybody who's interested can access all of our collected materials. I want to mention that uh, in this project, we will be sharing or including uh, much never-before-seen uh, materials. 
I'll mention a few things just to illustrate, I think, the, the scope and the depth of what we're uh, going to be sharing in this project. Uh, for Lordsburg, uh, we have uh, translated uh, a portion of a prisoner diary that was maintained there from Japanese to, uh, to English. So you'll be, you'll be hearing observations of prisoners in their own words. And again, for Lordsburg and Santa Fe, uh, as uh, Dr. Okawa mentioned, we also have other letters written by prisoners back to their families. And again, um, even given the censorship, their, their uh, expressions of their emotions and experiences back to their, to their families. And again, these were in Japanese, and we translated a number of them into uh, to English. Uh, another example, uh, for the Santa Fe camp, one of the, one of the prisoners uh, assembled a scrap album that uh, uh, he and others had put together. And this contains uh, original watercolor paintings of the, of the camp. It has calligraphy. It has poems that were written by the internees. Uh, and uh, also one of the interesting things that I found as I looked at it is that um, a number of the pages have Barrack by barrack uh, pages, and uh, individuals have signed their name on there to indicate that they were in that barrack, and they've also indicated the, their home address. So that proves very easily to anybody who looks at this, you know, the very reach of these camps in terms of where people came from. Uh, I think someone's they've touched on before, but the Santa Fe camp and the Lordsburg camp did have people all the way from Alaska, obviously Hawaii's been mentioned, a lot of folks from California, uh, et cetera. And uh, when, when you see these pages, and then people have s signed their names, and they indicate their home address, whether it's Los Angeles, California, uh, et cetera. I mean, it, to me, it brought home that these, are, these were real people who lived in these areas and then ended up in Santa Fe or Lordsburg. Another example of a, of a person who was in the Santa Fe <coughs> camp, he collected uh, uh, rocks at the camp, uh, put, a, put a, um, a bunch of these together, he, he polished them to make them look nicer, etc. When, um, when, when he was uh, released from the camp, he went back to Japan and he wanted to take his rock collection with him. The government said, no, you can't, you can't take that with you. Uh, part of the heartwarming story is about five to seven years later, the government did keep those in storage and they did send it to him. They found him in Japan and send it, sent it to him. So um, we actually have access to that rock collection. So that's another um, kind of never before seen material that, that relates back to the camp. Uh, uh, the last one I'll mention is, um, um, again, in the Santa Fe camp, one of the prisoners was a Shin Buddhist uh, priest and he kept the diary all the way through from Pearl Harbor Day to the day he was released in uh, um, March, I think, of 1946. And um, um, it's written in Japanese. The entire volume is, volumes are like a thousand pages. And uh, we're trying to find the funds to help translate that. Certain pages have been translated and certain researchers have written about it. but. I think you can imagine that it'd be a, a unique perspective by uh, a Buddhist priest who, who, who I'm sure was trained in Japan, but who lived in, in the U.S. before being picked up into this camp, how he, abs how he commented on you know, being um, uh, put into a, an American prison camp. Um, I should acknowledge that a number of these actually are the property and are kept at the History Museum in San at the Mexico History Museum. So we are, we've accessed those because they're obviously public and what we're helping the History Museum do is translate a number of these into Japanese. And the, the end result will be that the, the uh, primary material will be in the History Museum and we will donate the translations so that anybody who goes in there can look at both the original document as well as the translations. Obviously, researchers who go in can, can look at the original material if they want to and, and further analyze it. But um, on that, I want to mention that, um, to me, part of the importance is that you know, some, some 6,000 uh, internees went through the New Mexico camp uh, in total, uh, the great majority through Santa Fe and Lordsburg. But then 
what I find extra helpful in trying to understand the experience is to try to hear the individual stories of some of those people so you can think of them as, as one by one and how their experience is the same but also different in terms of their family, where they came from, how they coped with, with uh, the camp experience. Uh, so, so some of that material will be in the, in the final project results. Um, as I mentioned before, our scope is historic markers, an outreach publication, a website, and, and our target is to finish all of this by the spring of 2016. And we're in very good shape on that. On that. We, of us who are working on it, we've seen the draft or contributed to draft sections of all of this, and so we're now in the final review stage, and uh, the spring of, spring of next year is definitely the, the target that we're going to hit in terms of uh, release to the public. And then uh, after uh, spring, what we would like to do, New Mexico JCL and others and our supporters, is to take this story and a traveling exhibit across the, across the U.S. so we can help the general public understand the story with, with all this material and also obviously educate current and future students on this uh, chapter in New Mexico history. Um, <coughs> We have some of the project summaries over there at the table, and uh, afterwards uh, you're welcome to come by and talk to us. We can expand on some of the details, et cetera. But that's, that's uh, the major project that New Mexico JCL is working on, and I think uh, I know all of us who are involved feel very um, interested and gratified that we're, we're helping this story get out to, to the general public. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Lynn Oshima, who's a retired educator from the University of New Mexico, and she'll carry on with, I think, some discussion about the, the, the camp terminologies and maybe some of the other stories that will expand to hopefully uh, enhance your understanding of this uh, episode. Let's turn it off. Uh-oh, homework. And um, I was approached in about 2003 by the Japanese American National Museum who wanted to do a five-state project on the camps. And my first question was, why us? I mean, I knew, I knew what the big camps were in Wyoming, California, and everything, but I had not heard of anything similar in the state of New Mexico. So from that little, I can't even call it a seed, but from that little query emerged a, a three-year project with five teachers in the state to develop curriculum around the, um, the uh, internment camp, sort of the DOJ camp that was in Santa Fe. And it turned out it was very much new to also the teachers um, in the state that I was working with that the news about, any information about the uh, New Mexico camps was almost unknown everywhere. I mean, people started, once they, my colleagues started finding out I was working with that, they came out with a little newspaper article here and a little tidbit there. But essentially it was a really unfocused kind of uh, understanding of having a camp in, in Santa Fe, which was the largest camp there. But then things started to percolate, and all of a sudden out came the story of a second grade class in um, Santa Fe uh, that had gotten a History uh, Channel uh, grant, and they were going to focus on the Santa Fe camp. So, uh, and they were going to work with the Santa Fe Opera to come up with an opera about the camp. And, you know, I've been to college and I can't write an opera and I'm thinking about these second grade kids, you know, writing an opera and I'm going, what kind of education are they getting that I didn't get? And um, what it turned out to be was that the opera company came out with a, you know, a little kind of melody. And then the kids um, researched, they went out to the marker to, and they, uh, the teacher provided research material on um, people that were in the camps and what must they be feeling having had that, you know, to be away from their families and that sort of thing. So the title of the opera was Faces of the Enemy, 
And what the kids did was um, they would pop up, um, they had written haiku poetry. So the, the lyrics, if you will, to the opera was actually these haiku poems that the kids wrote, which I thought was just an amazing, amazing project. You know, because clearly the kids got into the topic in a way you'd like all students to get into topics with a lot of enthusiasm and um, really did a, uh, a great job. And then from that, things started to come out about the marker controversy in Santa Fe, how difficult that was to get it passed, and, and somewhat heroic of uh, political leaders to actually make that come about. And so anytime we think that there's a lack of courage in political leadership, I think the Santa Fe marker controversy is uh, an example of how that happens, and it happens in local communities. Um, and it's kind of regardless of whether you agree or disagree with whether the market should have been built, but it's just the way that individuals in a democratic society have to make decisions about uh, what they want to support and not support, and the price that you pay sometimes in uh, personal relationships, especially when it's in a local community that won't be the same the way they were before the controversy occurred. So anyway, I want to kind of take you back a little in your own um, past as a way to link to this project, and I want you to think way back to your high school years, and earlier, if you can cast that back that much farther, and I want you to think about what you learned about the internment camps when you were in high school. Zero. Okay. <laughs> okay, so did I. And, and here's my second embarrassment connection to this topic. I was uh, doing doctor work at Indiana University, and I was the uh, graduate assistant in the social studies methods course. And um, my instruct, my um, uh, the department chair uh, who was teaching the course ran a non-narrative film about um, this eight millimeter film where uh, there was a um, Asian and he was um, saying, uh, he wasn't really saying, but there were signs all over his, um, uh, his story that said, I am Chinese, not Japanese. And so he wanted these Midwest kids to talk about what might be going on in this film. <laughs> and of course the, uh, students had no idea because they had the same amount of information I had. And so then, of course, because I'm the GA, the graduate student, my chair defers to me and says, oh, Lynn, you must know a lot about this topic. And I'm going, what? <laughs> you know? I said, I read the same <coughs> social studies textbooks they read when they got out of high school. My social studies textbook barely had, I think it had about a paragraph. And I, I can't recall a picture. I can just recall a paragraph about that. So. I think one of the things that the image we had, and I grew up in Hawaii, and most of the folks, the, um, uh, the Japanese, fam um, my Japanese family was not relocated. I mean, most uh, Hawaii Japanese do not have a direct connection in a way with like the big WRA camps on the mainland, and um, not everyone had someone in the 700 that had sent to the Santa Fe camp. So, and then it's a topic over which no one, it's a topic over which no one talks about. You know, when people are in prison, you don't go talking to people about people who were in your family who were in prison. It's kind of embarrassing. So there was, as I think uh, Gail mentioned, there was, you know, no one talked about even other people who might have been, you know, in the camp. So one of the things I'd like you to do as we look at this issue about uh, um, how we tell the story, I'm going to have. I don't have enough for everybody, but I've got two versions of what are in two textbooks. And so um, if you can share, that would be a big help. <clears throat> and what I want you to do as you read these excerpts is sort of pay attention to what it is that you learn that's new. Um, what kind of interpretation do you think that the, is intended um, uh, that the students might get who read this? I think you need to get some to the back. Yeah. Sorry, but my printer quits at 20. <laughs> uh, so what happened to the, do we have some more back up here? Can we get some to the, this side? We don't have any this side, so just. Okay, so if you could take a moment to read through the passage, and if you finish reading the passage, can you pass it on? 
I think it's somewhat marked in a bracket where the passage starts on the uh, internment camp. So the first question I'm going to ask you after you read it is, what do you notice about the language of the, uh, of the text? Very scholarly. Very scholarly. What, what makes you say scholarly? Well, it's not like reading the newspaper. <laughs> it's not as interesting as reading the newspaper. <laughs> And you'll notice there are really two different kinds of passages that have been there. They're, they're from um, two textbooks. And um, you'll be relieved to know that the textbooks haven't changed in size. They probably weigh about the same amount as they were when we were in school because I don't think you can make them heavier. I don't think kids can carry heavier books than these, but these are, are two of them. Now, Anybody else have some comments that you've noticed about the passages? Yes. I, I've only read the, the one from A People and a Nation, but it seems to be fairly honest in describing that the relocation camps are in quotes and that even though uh, uh, Italian and Germans were interned because of specific actions on their part, Japanese were interned as a group and that ra the term racism is used. So this particular one uh, from 2005 seems to not gloss over the injustice. The, like the comparison, the by the comparison to the other people we were at war with. Okay, who else? Anybody else have a comment they want to make? It puts, yeah. a, it puts quotations around sneak attacks. I noticed. Because it's under question. By who though? Almost no one I know really questions the idea. Gail raised that idea about the so-called sneak attack. Anybody know why that might be well, a suspect? Well, I think idea? we put Japan under pressure by, um, doing, make, by um, having an oil embargo. Okay, that's one possibility. Somebody else? Uh, there's other evidence that various non-traditional scholars have raised that we did have intelligence the attack was coming, but we needed an excuse to go to war. And so we weren't, may not have known the extent of the attack. Um, and there's a little aside I always like to throw out that if you, if you look at the, 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 the journal, everything from Southern Colorado to Western Texas, Pearl Harbor did not make it on the front page of most of those papers. It was Jack bombed Manila Bay because that's where our war was from. Oh, okay, yeah. I'm struck by the economic uh, issue of competition and that the uh, Japanese were being <coughs> quite successful and were competing with uh, American um, issues. Mm -hmm. and that yeah, that so it's always, push. you know, one thing about history, it's always a mixed bag. I mean, when, when you get into the details of the story, there's always a real, some real stories in there. Yeah. I, it would seem to me that what happened to the Japanese people in the, war, in the outbreak of the war, that was the attitude, prevailing attitude in the country was uh, bound up tooth and nail to the, the African American slave, post slavery, uh, racist, uh, continuing racist and annihilation. I think that, that I factored in really big. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's all we have. American Past and Present, 7th edition. And I guess when I started reading it, I thought it was kind of factual. By the time I finished it, it was like, and there was some justification that it was right. And then- How'd you get that? Because, <laughs> because of that whole comment about, we were at war, so there was some justification that what happened was okay. And then there are quotes in mine 
was one of the quotes was, um, you know, talking about how wonderful the um, 442 was and a commander would issue a familiar appeal in quotes, calling the Japs, which is in itself derogatory. And then the last quote of the section that they interviewed some guy and he, the, a Japanese American who said it was terrible um, with tears in his eyes, but it was a time of war, anything can happen. I didn't blame the United States for that. Again, it somehow justifies. Uh -huh. Interesting. Somebody else? Anybody else? Okay. Yeah. Well, not commenting on that, I just wanted to relate. I gra I'm Sansei and I graduated Lovington High School in 1965. I had never gotten any exposure to the history of the uh, WRA at all. I went to the University of Colorado in the fall of 1965 just as Bill Hosokawa's book, Nisei, was being printed. That's the first I ever heard. My parents didn't, never talked about it when I was growing up. And, and, and when I read it, I was totally stunned and shocked because when I took world history and American history, there was no mention whatsoever of it in 1965. Yeah. One, um one of the papers is marked yellow, and I forget which one it is. I, it has a little yellow dot on it. That's the AP, the Advanced Placement Textbook. So that's the one that uh, um, some of you read. I, now, I happen to have read both, and unfortunately, I couldn't give you both times. There's a, there's a little comparison between the articles that's really interesting. And your comment is really important because the idea usually is that textbooks are neutral, that you get objective history in a textbook, OK? Boring in a sense, because they're not written like newspapers, which um, uh, kids are quick to figure out. They aren't meant to be interesting. But, the, but there is an assumption that the language in a textbook ought not to be inflammatory, or it ought not to in any way represent a particular point of view. However, that neutrality is a point of view, okay, in a sense, when you think of it. it, it yeah, is a pot, you know, and this is why the exploration of the language issue is so important. Neutrality, I don't think exists because w this summer we had the controversy in Texas over a textbook on slavery that talked about slaves being immigrants. You know, which, yeah, which is. So words back. I mean, what what fueled that latest textbook controversy in Texas was the idea of referring to slaves, substituting the word worker for slaves. Now what they're faced with is this tremendous million dollar problem about what to do with these new textbooks they have purchased. And how do you put a correction in because the books are already out there and it's gonna be really expensive and the publisher isn't thinking that he wants to reset the type for the book. <laughs> I have to say that just deciding what gets included and what doesn't is a form of bias. And um, I, like everyone else, never heard of the internment camps until I became an adult. I mean, it was nothing I knew about. Uh, I was doing a research at Penn State, and I stumbled on this information, and I was like, what? Because I never heard anything about it in my, you know, in my um, high school or, you know, any other place. And, and I have to say, there are limits to inclusion. Like, I, I have to say that, you know, based on just the amount that you've seen in the text, that's an amazing amount of space in a textbook on, an, on a topic that in our time, for many of us, was barely a paragraph. I mean, there is an expansion in the coverage. Of course, we all realize that students do not read textbooks, so that's no guarantee. Uh, the inclusion issue is no guarantee they're actually gonna know the topic. A lot more has to be done than, um, in a way than just reading, but I do think that the um, the awareness of this as an issue raises some interesting story, um, historiographical issues about inclusion, exclusion of topics, and then how it ends. Now, there are two different terminologies in both articles. The one that's the AP one with the yellow dot says forced relocation, okay? The one in the other one says what? Just says, says removal, okay? Now, is there a difference between forced relocation and removal? <laughs> okay, <laughs> like, is there, a difference, is there a difference between concentration camp and internment camp? Yes. 
okay? Is there a difference between voluntary evacuation and forced removal? Okay, so words matter, right? Now, I'm gonna give you, pass out next. Can we get back these things? Maybe we get four parts of that front, back, front and back. There's only about 20 of them. And if you would share this, this is a statement from the Japanese American National Museum on the, what terminology that they have taken, on a position they've taken on the terminology in regards to um, uh, what to call the camps. And, any more? And so can you guys share like three to a share? Because it's not a very long statement. I'll say to this to you too, this statement, it, you can get it online. A lot of the things that I'll give you some references for, but they're, they're pretty much online if you really want to pursue them more deeply. But there was an article by uh, Raymond Okamura, and he talks about euphemisms, and his, the title of his article is America's Concentration Camps. And, and he looks at the evolution of language for describing the camp. Now, the initial reference to what was going to be constructed by the, from the president, FDR is the first one to, I mean, is notable. He's not the first, but he's, I'm sure his aides and everything looked around about what were we going to call these things. And the best word at, operative at the time in the 1940s was concentration camp. You know, that was before they knew what concentration camp would come to mean. Um, with what happens with Jews in Europe um, by, uh, from the Nazis. But up, up until 1940, the operative word was concentration camp. And that statement from JANM, um, the, the Japanese National Museum, explains why concentration camp was the word then. Now, Okamura's article is really interesting because he talks about the evolution of wording because there was not an immediate back off from using concentration camp there because th there still wasn't, I think, widely known information about um, the extermination policies of the Nazis in, in um, uh, their concentration camps. But I do think they started going for things like relocation center, assembly center, internment camp, which then became um, the used word. Uh, and that's the one that we have now. I beg your pardon? <laughs> well, yeah. But, you, and I, I particularly take you to the last sentence in the JANM statement about why they think concentration camp is the operative word. And, um, despite, um, some differences, all concentration camps have one thing in common. People in power remove a minority group from the general population and the rest of society lets it happen. Pretty powerful definition. But one that in a way doesn't really, you know, I mean, if, you know, one of the things that's been difficult in teaching kids about what happened you know, with this policy of the government is they have to understand the difference between DOJ and WRA camps. They have to understand uh, um, the difference between the kind of prisoners that were in one and the kind of prisoners that were in the other. Never really told us that, and I don't understand okay, the Department of Justice camps really had more to do with men. They were not family camps. So the pictures that we have, the, the large array of pictures that exist, is mainly about those um, Japanese that were sent to the WRA camps, which were the family camps. DOJ was like the Santa Fe camp, the Lordsburg camp. They were mainly men, and they were not citizens. They were not citizens, but they were the leadership that they had already picked out before. What? And they left the communities without their respective leaders. Well, it was interesting about how you could know, you know how the list was, was formed. Clearly, some of the people were prominent that you knew about um, that were going to be picked up. Okay, is that better? Oh, okay. Well, um, the the so the WR the you don't find, for example, Ansel Adams and Dorothea Lang taking pictures in DOJ camps. Okay, those were really separate. There were no pictures. These were considered the most dangerous of the dangerous. 
um, most suspect. Now, who got rounded up is really kind of interesting because for some people, it may, you knew who was going to get picked up. Um, the newspaper editor, <laughs> um, the minister, community type leaders like that were likely to be on that list that Gail talked about because the pickup was so quick after Pearl Harbor of some of these um, uh, men that you knew that there had to be a list. I mean, they, it didn't just, you know, something that they could have done very quickly. But on the other hand, there were names that were added to the list. One of the um, prisoners, a man named George Hoshida, uh, who actually did write one of the few first person accounts we have of life in the camp. He did drawings and um, he actually put a memoir um, to, together about his time in Santa Fe and Lordsburg. He was selling appliances in a store at the time that he was picked up. So he never found out why he was on the list. And I think for a good number of them, that might have been the case. I, I did a little PowerPoint for a presentation and like some, one guy was a barber, another one was a farmer, another one was like an appliance salesman and, and that kind of thing. Um, and so, uh, and some of them, like George Hoshida said, he never knew why he was on that list or what he was picked for. Now, jujitsu instructor, well, that's a possibility, martial arts, you know, that might be put you on the list. But for some of the, uh, um, if you weren't a community leader, they did get more than just community leaders, um, you know, in the camp. So it's hard to say how the list was put together, really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, when people say, you know, why would teaching about this matter? I mean, you know, in the scope of World War II, this is another event that happened. In this, um, and, but I do think that uh, the connection to the present, the marker controversy was really clear that there's still a lot to be said about uh, ex understanding or trying to see the injustice of what happened um, in 19, after Pearl Harbor. But I also think the other thing is we're still facing national security versus civil rights issues today. And, and usually national security wins, you know, and that's where the, the caution is about, you know, where, you know, with the Paris attacks that occurred the other day, you can imagine, you know, the, what's going through um, French society at that point about where do they feel their security is more important than what might be civil rights um, protections. And, and I think we're in the same way because I don't, you know, the one thing with a shrinking world is we are, it's so easy to get to be connected. That's right, during the Civil War, right. So I think when this thing about, you know, uh, the importance of studying topics at the microcosm, when you take on something, you're likely to find a lot of connections that can be made to the present. And it's not just something that is in the past. And the Egyptians have a, can really tell you that the past isn't l old enough. They're thousands of years old. We're just, what, uh, m munching along to our next 300th uh, anniversary or something that we're still new at this um, democracy building. But anyway, um, yeah. Yeah, so I would just say that, uh, just leave you with this message as you leave uh, the presentation later this afternoon. Um, be very curious to know how you will retell the story of what happened in 1941. What will your verbs be? What your, will your nouns be? 
and just remember everything you know information is lends itself very easily to interpretation the facts all mean something however few facts you use or however many you clutter up the story the fact is that it's very interest it's very hard to be neutral or totally objective or fi or um, sort of um, well I'll go back to that word neutral you know in the way we tell talk about our history it's usually highly interpretive but I never heard anything about Santa Fe except from my mother who was a school teacher but I never read anything in a book but when she happened purely by accident to mention it I said well where was it to this day I don't know where the camp was can you explain that you know it's really hard because the marker is not at the site of the camp I mean there's very expensive real estate that now forms the basis of where the camp was as I understand it wouldn't you put it that way that there are, so it's really in the city itself yeah yeah it was we, we want to uh, um, continue this conversation you know this is a dialogue that needs to be you know continued over and over again but in the interest of, of time uh, I, I'd like to bring our cast of characters back and if you would bring your chairs and uh, and form a little uh, semicircle uh, you know if you have questions for the rest of our presenters here and you know we've made this a very long day for Eileen O'Connell I mean, she has been here since early morning because at 10.30, you know, she hosted uh, the Italian-American community. And when I walked in here at noon, there were little babies and, you know, people were still uh, congregated here. So this is the weekend and uh, she does more than she's required to, far beyond the call of duty. And Eileen has agreed to be our moderator for a Q&A and any questions that you might want to pose to the people here. And so I think probably everybody would like to start with, could we get an idea of what the actual assumed geography is in Santa Fe? I know it's, it's sort of in what has developed as the city of Santa Fe, but which shopping center, which? <laughs> so, do, do we have like an intersection or? Bealinda Mall? So. talked about the you know the marker issue and you know he got to sit in a room as the only Japanese guy with a room full of Bataan survivors but you know Bataan death march survivors and so he his uh, he said to me where that hotel is as you come out of Santa Fe going north on St. Francis Drive um, opposite the National Cemetery is a hotel, and I forget what it is today. The El, El Dorado, or the used to be the Ramada. Somewhere, somewhere around there. Solano. Okay, well. Okay, well, the, you, you know Ben then, so. So north of Alameda, west of Guadalupe, Casa Solana. by there and said that those those were a couple of the barracks buildings from 
from the internment camp, which had previously been a CCC camp in the 1930s. I'm from Lordsburg, would you believe? <laughs> and I would like to know when was the camp at Lordsburg established? And I know from stories that I've heard as a child that it initially started out as a camp for Japanese, and then it made a transition to prisoner of war camp, and it included German and Italian prisoners. And we would see, as, as children, we would see these prisoners being trucked to the mines, to work in the mines. And so we were aware that there, this was happening, but we had no idea of dates. Could you enlighten me? I don't have the specific date. Uh, you know, I don't have the specific date for the Lordsburg camp itself. In fact, it's kind of interesting because either the Hawaii, the 700 Hawaii um, uh, men were brought over and, and they talk about going to Santa Fe first, then Lordsburg. Mm -hmm. So it really sounds like Lordsburg comes after Santa Fe. Did and then, I beg your pardon? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, it's got to be 42. And um, I would, uh, you know, I just really, I would just say late 42, you know, by the time they were able to get the transport to bring these guys to the West Coast. I mean, that's one reason that made um, internment of Hawaii Japanese difficult was getting all the transport in a time of war. It's the only camp that was specifically built for the Japanese. Uh, the yeah, other sure. locations were, were existing. But can I tell you a, a little story that just occurred a few days ago and that I told Jose in the, in the audience, you know, I, I said we're going to Lordsburg. Uh, and Molly Fester, who's the curator of the Lordsburg Museum, you know, we've been working with. Um, so she called a few days ago and said, Lordsburg is off. And she said it's because calls have been coming in uh, to the um, um, Chamber of Commerce, right, not, not the city council. Um, and, and she said, you know, because the Japs are coming to Lordsburg, and that's why it was canceled. We were to present at the high school there. Um, and so, uh, you know, we had many, my, my entire day was taken uh, up with phone calls back and forth. Then later in the afternoon, Molly calls again, and uh, she says, it's on, but it's going to be in the mayor's office. And the mayor of Lordsburg's name is uh, Clark Smith like Clark Kent, Superman, right? Okay, he said, we will not stand down. I don't know this man, you know, I didn't know who the mayor was. And he said, if the school doesn't want to do it, we'll do it in the mayor's chambers. So I wanted to do it in the mayor's chambers. I told everybody, right? Because then we would have a more of an adult audience and then it wouldn't be a high school assembly. Because the principal said, you're lucky if you get their attention for 45 minutes. Uh, so, you know, so I, I told, you know, and this story has gone uh, around. Uh, however, later in the day, Molly called back and said, the principal has now decided that it will be back in the high school. So that's where we're going on, uh, on Monday. But I still, you know, I, I have a project in mind, you know, that like profiles of courage, that it takes these little acts, you know, and here's somebody I've never met, and I'm also told that he can't afford to be mayor. You know, he has a part-time job at the mines. So um, when I go to Lordsburg, at least I'm going to, um, you know, shake his hand. To, to, your, to your question, uh, and, and I'm, uh, reading from our uh, work plan for the CLO project. The, um, uh, the camp itself uh, started, the construction of the camp started in the end of January 1942. The first detainees uh, appeared in June of, of 42, and the camp was operated until June of 1945.
uh, you know, and again, I, I can look at the, the book further, but uh, there was approximately 1,500 total that uh, at some time were at the Lordsburg camp. And uh, as, as I, I alluded to before, I used the 6,000 number figure for the total number of uh, detainees that were in the New Mexico camps. So about 4,500 uh, uh, at some point were in the Santa Fe camp and about 1,500 in uh, um, Lordsburg. The, the two small camps that I mentioned in uh, Lincoln County were extremely small uh, and uh, uh, even more specialized use, but they still were operated as part of the federal government confinement. Um, I, I'm reaching, again, I, I have to caveat myself. I'm not the academic working on this, I'm, so I'm going to report on what I understand. Come on Wednesday, Professor Andrew Russell. Yes, yes. Uh, and, 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 I, and, and as I think as, as one of the audience members mentioned, my understanding is that for those that were put into the camp, there never was a process to where they were, uh, you know, gone through some evaluation and that the government took a formal action on each case. They were in mass, uh, you know, uh, ordered to these camps. Uh, in terms of after you're in the camp, um, I, I have read that there have been a number of attempts that were made by the prisoners to try to, to try to have a hearing. And I think some of the hearings were held, but the outcome, you know, I, I think in all cases was, you know, uh, you know not successful. The general understanding I have is that uh, yes, the uh, uh, the families uh, were in the uh, the regular uh, WRA camps, and uh, some of them, like the Hawaii yeah. yes. prisoners, most of them had their families stay with them. They had the option, and some of them the families did come up to the mainland and go to the camps. And the only way I know that they got out of the confinement camps was that um, when the camps were starting to close, then the men were given an option of going to Crystal City in Texas, where they could um, rejoin family that had been in the camps or bring their families up, and they would be sent to one of the family camps. So in other words, they were closing down the uh, DOJ camps. But because these were men, and because they were considered more serious threats than the grandfathers and the kids that were sent to the family camps, there really wasn't a way for them to come out. Like, for example, I, they couldn't, as I understand it, joined the military as the, you know, the guys in the WRA camps or who were born American citizens. They could join the military, but I don't think the DOJ, because most of those uh, men were not citizens, could have joined the military to get a way out. And then the other option for getting out of the WRA camp was that if you found a job in the interior of the United States, then um, in Chicago or something, then you could go. That not many, mostly young people might have did take advantage of that, but not in substantial numbers. I mean, the camps were still quite, you know, large um, because people, I guess, you know, packing up and going to Chicago didn't seem to be any easier than um, the way they had to leave their homes initially. So, um, but getting out of the DOJ camps, I think, was really hard, much harder than getting out of the WRA camps. And I don't know of any process that the government put in place that said some of you can get out of here, you know, if you fulfill certain conditions. No, there wasn't, there wasn't a camp in Gallup. Yeah. Just interesting stories, though, because Gallup was one of the fully integrated Japanese communities in New Mexico. And so there's a difference between uh, what happened to some Japanese who were sent to be incarcerated and then the Gallup community that chose not to do that. I, I, think, I think part of the, what we're saying is, and I think you, some of you understand, when you get to precise details, it's, it's complicated. We're trying to give the broad picture, but, but as, as uh, Lynn said, uh, um, you know, uh, 
as I understand it, some of the men uh, eventually did have the option to go join their families in some of the WRA camps, but, but uh, th there was no set policy or procedure that you can say, well, this is exactly what the government did. Uh, I, I do want to mention very quickly, which again illustrates uh, um, a slice of the story in New Mexico. In, uh, as someone asked about Gallup, Gallup was one of the very strong positive stories because uh, there was an integrated population, including Japanese Americans, and, and the local uh, residents and the government, uh, I think they were approached by the federal government saying, well, what are you going to do, you know, what are you going to do about the Japanese Americans in your community? And they said, you know, they're our neighbors and our friends. There's no issue here in Gallup, basically, you know, uh, get out of town. Um, the, the Clovis story, there were about 32 um, Japanese, uh, people of Japanese ancestry who had been living in Clovis since the 20s. And primarily they were there because they were workers for the railroad company. And then when, when, when the war broke out, um, there was a lot of anti-Japanese feelings that came out and, and the, the federal government did move those 32 people to, um, uh, to Old Baca Ranch. That's why that's mentioned. Um, and that included men, women, kids uh, who were in, in that particular location. Uh, but they were under, again, federal government uh, imprisonment. Uh, but that's separate from those that were brought to Santa Fe or Lordsburg from far away. What a neat story to, to show the passage that we did have some articles. If you could speak to it then about the student and the CNN. Yeah, I, again, that, that, that's partly what I touched on in, in my, my quick uh, few minutes is that when you break it down, there's a lot of very interesting, there's a lot of complexity, but also a lot of uh, hardships, but uh, some heartwarming stories as well. In the Clovis situation, uh, yeah, there, there was a student who was going to central New Mexico, and uh, one of his uh, professors, actually uh, uh, Dr. Andy Russell and Dr. Cara Carroll, uh, were teaching, uh, uh, I think it was American and uh, New Mexico history, and they mentioned the internment uh, situation and got to the detail, including talking about Clovis. And, and this student, uh, Adrian, was from Clovis, and he said, what, what's this? You know, he was just shocked that this happened in his hometown. And he got so uh, incensed and motivated that he immediately went back to the city and talked to the city leaders and said, you know, there's got to be something done about this because this was clearly an injustice and, you know, it happened in his hometown. The, the end result of that was that he, he w helped convince the city council, the mayor, to basically uh, give a formal apology to this action in, uh, in World War II, and then uh, identified three individuals who, who were, of, of these three, of the 32, who were still living, uh, one in Ohio, two in, in Oregon, and invited them back, and, and they served as grand marshal of the, of the, of the, uh, of the annual uh, rodeo festivity that they have in Clovis. And, and, I, and I've got articles and I've got pictures of them sitting in the grand marshal uh, vehicle, and and so, uh, without belaboring any more, I mean this is a case where the entire community, including its political leaders, gave a formal apology and held you know many events honoring honoring this uh, set of folks who were removed back in uh, uh, World War II. So so you know you can say that there were a lot of bad things done in Clovis back then, but. The good thing is that you know the, the good people of Clovis recognized that it was something bad, and they formally went on record and formally apologized to these three individuals, at, you know, representing the rest of the of the 32 that were, were taken away. Uh, in 1967, I was working with the anti-war movement on the on the West Coast. I think it's kind of a neat bit of irony. And we had a demonstration, an anti-draft demonstration in Oakland, thousands of people, and they, and they arrested hundreds of us, and, and they took, I don't know, I don't know how many, uh, several hundred uh, of the demonstrators and put them in, in the barracks uh, that they were using uh, sometime during the war against the Japanese. 
So I thought that was kind of an irony that, you know, the American government's in jail jailing their own. And, you know, I already said this, but I, I, th I know a lot about uh, history of the United States, and I think it's, it's, there's a, it's a, a, a binding connection between all these different struggles, struggles over the last 500 years since the, since the European invasion of the Western Hemisphere. Some years ago, there were plans in the, for the state of California to make Manzanar into a state park with a history museum. Did that ever happen? Uh, I, I can't speak for the details, but, but again, under this National Park Service funding program that, that we're doing this GLOW project, um, uh, a number of the large uh, war relocation sites have been given funding to designate them as, um, uh, I'm trying to think what the words are, but, but they are designated as, uh, um, yeah, I'm thinking something like a federal monument, and, and th there has been money provided to have visitor centers and small, uh, you know, like museum facilities so that there are exhibits for people to go, go visit those. And so, so uh, yeah, I, I don't think they're called national parks or national monuments, but they're, but they are partly to that point that you're, you're asking about. Yeah, it's federal. Um, I want to introduce one of the translators of the Lordsburg Papers that you'll be hearing more about on Wednesday at the Maxwell Museum. Ikuko Begay is here, and uh, you know, uh, Sam Mihara has donated the diaries to us, but they were written in Japanese by his father-in-law, and Ikuko and uh, her colleague have translated those, and it's a really, it's a treasure, you know, to the state of New Mexico. Um, and so we'll be doing some readings on Wednesday from those diaries, and I, I think you'll find there's a very controversial incident that happened, the shooting of the two Japanese men, and I want to add, I think it's important for you to know that the DOJ camps were operated under the Geneva Convention rules. And uh, so uh, officially prisoner of war camps. And then later, uh, when the Japanese were moved to Santa Fe and the uh, German and Italian prisoners of wars occupied Lordsburg. But th that's also part of the confusion because there's still a feeling that the men who were in Lordsburg, who were Issei men, mostly older, my dad was in his 50s, were um, Japanese soldiers that were captured in Japan. Um, so, and then because of the, you know, extreme feelings about the um, Bataan Death March, you know, and so I really feel it's important to keep these th certain things in context even you know about the story of Lordsburg from a few days ago because you cannot discount people's emotions and uh, so under the situations of those times with a lack of knowledge of each other this is what happens and this is why we're here you know to have a dialogue and Davis Begay Ikuko's husband is the uh, honorary consulate for Japan Thank you very much. So they were the ones then, because they weren't allowed to acquire citizenship, they were sent to these camps because they didn't have citizenship. Is that right? Right. So the citizenship factor became sort of those um, uh, pledge to allegiance when they were going to school, and then after Pearl Harbor, I think in a way I would have been the, the most surprised to uh, find out that what I had learned in school about the that I had rights and that the government couldn't take away your rights. And all of a sudden, all those worksheets I filled out and all those classes and books that I read, it wasn't true, you know, because they went to camp, too. Right. So I'm, I'm talking about the ones who came to uh, New Mexico camps. 
You said they were not citizens. They were, not, they were mainly men who, because they couldn't become citizens, they were li listed as aliens, right? And then after right. Pearl Harbor, they got listed as enemy aliens right. because now we were at war. So they were, yeah, those were the, they were mainly non-citizens. Because yeah. originally when they came, they weren't allowed to become citizens. There's an uh, interesting term that Okamura brings out in his article about non-alien, which I, uh, which I thought was an in I never heard that one before, but what he was doing was it was a search of the government to try to find vocabulary for what they were doing. So non-alien is, can you guess what a non-alien was? It was an American citizen. It was an American citizen. Because you were not an alien, so you no, were an I American was a, citizen. I they, was a non-alien. I was born in, in America. So they couldn't say they were imprisoning citizens, so what they did was say they were non-aliens. Go ahead. Nice. My, my question is, I don't remember exactly, but I believe it was the JACL that brought the, brought the challenge to all of this to the Supreme Court that signed off on it, but I can't... Minyasui. Yes, thank you. There were four legal challenges brought during that time that all made it to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court upheld. They were all based on different legal theories. Minyasui was here in Albuquerque, I believe, about 10 or 12 years ago before he passed, and he talked about it, and I went to his lecture, it was great. He was a young lawyer at that time in Seattle. He said he had to work to get himself arrested. He purposely went into the exclusion area and asked to be arrested, and because the local constable knew him, they told him to go home. He said, we're not going to arrest you. So he kept insisting. He finally got himself arrested under the Exclusion Act and took his challenge up. Uh, Hitabayashi was another one of the cases. There were four cases. I can't remember the other two, but Minyasui and Hitabayashi, all four of the cases made it to the U.S. Supreme Court and they were upheld. In the 80s, I think the government it was, was upheld. The, the, well, the Supreme the Court upheld the acts of the government. But in 83, I think it was Hitabayashi's case, was reheard by the Supreme Court, and they did something pretty unprecedented. And I think it was under a theory called uh, Cori Novus. Uh, Cori Novus. Novus. That. 1985. 85. And the Supreme Court did something totally unprecedented. They overturned those four cases based on this principle, kind of saying but not saying that it was because of the lies and the misacts of the U.S. government. So there was kind of a overturning of those cases in 85, uh, but the original cases were all upheld on war necessity. So. It, it's a very, inter if, if you're interested in the legal parts of this, it's very interesting to study those four cases because they're all based on four different legal theories, but they were, the, the, the acts of the government were upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court after the war when those four cases finally got up there. Well, yesterday we um, <coughs> received word uh, from the New Mexico Humanities Commission, that our next project, which is called Minyasui in New Mexico, was unanimously approved with the full funding that we had requested. So next year, maybe around this time, you will be uh, meeting Holly Yasui, Minyasui's daughter, who's written a play about the very incident you talked about Minya Sui walking the streets of Portland, Oregon for three hours, breaking the curfew laws and trying to get arrested. And uh, his time in jail, uh, nine months in solitary confinement, and his encounter with Senator Pete Domenici of New Mexico. And we still have members of the JCL who were at that very meeting, which kind of uh, transformed the history of the redress movement. So you'll be getting more word about that. And Holly has all, also um, created a documentary that will be shown at the Japanese American National Museum on April 30th that George Takei is narrating. And then Holly comes immediately here 
from Los Angeles because hearing about uh, the stories of men in New Mexico, this is the first state that she wanted to come to on her stop. general interest, which I think, again, you brought up. Um, the federal government did, did put together a commission and look at the whole uh, uh, internment process. And uh, I think it was in the, in the 1980s that that commission met and did make a finding that the government did make a mistake. And uh, that, that led to what we saw that uh, um, Herb and Nikki referred to the uh, the Reagan signing of the uh, letter of apology. Yeah, yeah. That particular act was after the commission found that the government had acted incorrectly in uh, in the World War II, and then that led to then the redress and the apology and the twenty thousand dollars to those who were still living uh, from the incarceration. So, so. On the positive, you can say the government finally did go through the process and and uh, you know make the correct finding, even though all the suffering happened. It so only took 40 years. Yeah, it only took 40 years. <laughs> so you know, like I said, I mean, you have to point out the positive. I, I think the other thing, quick thing I said before, if it would break up, because as you reminded me, um, most of us who talk about the internment experience, uh, one of the themes that we say is that. You know, we, we do it for our sake to tell everybody the history of the internment, but also it's to tell people, yeah, you know, point out the injustice that happened and that we all should learn as a society that we need to be vigilant about civil rights and liberty and so forth so that it does not happen again to other minority groups. And, and, and again, that's been pointed out today we still have those issues, but when, when we Japanese Americans, part of what we say is that, yes, we want to describe this history to you and point out, obviously, the incorrect aspects of that, but to learn from history and that all of us should try to do our best so that we don't repeat that against other, other people. That, that's one of, as, as uh, Yuki said, one of our mission statement lines is that we devote ourselves to protecting the civil liberties of all people, not just Japanese Americans. You will find it interesting to compare what happened in this country to what happened in Canada. And I just point out that Vancouver, BC, has almost no Japanese community. And that's what can, they can you share yeah, that with the rest of us? We can't hear you. They can't hear you. Repeat it. Well, um, Canada did, did much the same things that this country did, only worse. That's all I have to say. And Vancouver, I'm originally from Seattle. I probably went to your high school if you stayed there. And uh, they, uh, they have a very large community in Vancouver and on Vancouver Island. And they got the redress many years earlier than the American redress. That's not what I heard. No, they did. They were not released from camps until when? Do you know? 1947. They were never compensated for their, their property. All the fishing boats were sold by the government the day they were interned. Their houses were sold. There's a very good book, I forget what the lady's name is, but it came out a couple of years ago. And she was one of the people who was uh, moved. I've been to some of the internment camps. There were two of them in BC. Most of them were further east. And most of them <coughs> never moved back because there was nothing for them to move back to. And that's equally true here. We're not trying to com compare who was more victimized than, than another. They did uh, have a redress movement and they received their redress and nobody got compensated for the loss of their property. You know, that's usually, that does not happen in any of these cases. I think we'll need to continue these discussions less formally. Um, and in conclusion, if, if the panel members have a, a parting reflection before we break up and move into to smaller conversations, I'd just like to remind them that uh, 
when we talk about people of color, that white is a color too. So we need need to include all of all the all the people.